This meaning is being recorded. so used to it. Okay. Um, so I'll say it again. Welcome. <laughs> it's so nice to see all of you on this beautiful, beautiful sunny day. Um, this is uh, May 1st, May Day, which is very appropriate for our service today. We have um, my longtime friend, Susan Haas, here who uh, worked very hard to become a master gardener um, officially for Massachusetts. And so May Day seems fitting to bring her around. Um, she loves to garden and she actually loves to weed. So, you know, um, we can get into that, right? She's been at UU for many years, considers herself a Jewish Unitarian Universalist, third generation San Franciscan, who moved to Boston and considers herself a transplant that took. She loves it here. She likes the seasons and the colors and the everything. So um, she used to be a geriatric social worker, which she was actually very good at as well. It seems like there isn't anything that this woman can, can't do. So I just want to say, I'm so glad you're here. I'm really glad she's here to celebrate the spring and i um, honored to share the pulpit with her today. Thank you. Any announcements? Yes. Uh, our continues to be miracles. We have now 37 different countries. Whatever we're doing, we're entertaining somebody. And uh, we're talking about a post miracles, uh, which is something we may or may not be interested in. Every Friday, uh, they bought is one of our participants. Uh, Richard Trudeau is also one of our panel. Alan Lugan is somewhere. And we're having the board. So we have a joke for four hundred participants to the budget. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I was going to announce that, but go ahead. No, you do it. Richard, you do it. Yeah, no, at the um, 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 First Parish in Hubbardston. Yes. On May 14th. May 14th. 1 p.m. Yes. I'm sorry? Where's Hubbardston? Where's Hubbardston? It is um, next to Gardner. Oh. Okay, there's a little rotary that goes to Route 6. Yeah. Um, the church is on Main Street, number two Main Street. It's one of the big white churches in the middle of the square. It's up on the hill. Um, there are cows and horses next door, so. May 14th, 1 p.m. Saturday, yes. Anybody is welcome to come. Um, just give me a head count, you know, in a few days from now so I can let them know for food purposes. It will be safe. The food is going to be wrapped and, um, and there won't be a lot. It's going to be very simple, but uh, anyone who wants to be there is welcome to come. Okay. Thank you. Please join us in our child side words in the order of service. We light our chalice flame. Good morning. The invocation comes from Rachel Carlson. <laughs> the invocation comes from Rachel Carlson. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. Please rise now in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In.
Please join us for our affirmation. Number 471. No, 470. We affirm the unfailing renewal of life. Rising from the earth, the nation of the sun, all of the creatures shall show themselves. We affirm the steady growth of human human companionship. Rising from the ancient burials and reaching the desires, people in the world of ours feel steady growth. We affirm a continuing hope. The now the great tragedy, the spirits of individuals shall rise to the living world. Join us for our antiphonal reading. Number 550. We belong to the earth. It's credited, um, written by Chief Noah Self, also known as Chief Seattle. This we know. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. All things are connected. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely merely a strand in it. And now please rise and body your spirit for our next hymn, number 175. I play the whole tune, it's not as familiar.
Good morning. It's really a pleasure on this May day to be talking to you all about my favorite subject, the joy of environmental gardening. This is the story of my journey beginning at Ip Ipswich River Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary, leading to becoming a certified master gardener and ending up with being the lead gardener at Endicott Community Garden in Danvers through the North Shore UU Church there. It all began about five years ago when I retired from my career in healthcare. Now what, I wondered. Then it came to me, literally, in the brochure from the Ipswich River Audubon Sanctuary. There were tons of things to learn and do. So many choices, until I found gardening with master gardener, Catherine Carney Feldman. The group met every Tuesday morning from eight to 11. I decided to give it a try. Catherine's background was in teaching, but she had been volunteering for more than 20 years, caring for bird and butterfly gardens. In her professional life, she was a landscape business owner and a member of the Ipswich Conservation Commission. At the same time I was joining Catherine and her group of gardeners, I was also thinking about doing something I had always wanted to do, study to become a master gardener. Now, I didn't know a great deal about master gardeners, but I knew they were folks who do beautiful plantings around town but I had no idea what was ahead of me. Truth be told, I almost didn't apply because I had heard there were tests and I was never a good test taker. I shared my reservations with Catherine and she said, no problem, the test is open book. Yay, I enrolled. The master gardeners began in 1977, it's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide information and knowledge about gardening through education, horticulture, and gardening. There are levels of membership going all the way up to lifetime master gardener. If I live long enough, I might achieve that. Master gardener activities include the helpline, outreach at community fairs, creating exhibits at the Boston Flower Show, planting activities, and a variety of other activities. Let me share some of those with you. First, I spent the day making plantings for the Boston Flower Show. I guess it I thought it was just some sort of magic that created that garden. Actually, it involves huge mounds of mulch, and many plant, potted plants. Master gardeners create a theme and design for the display. We worker bees make it happen. We can also be found at a master gardener's booth where you can ask any questions you might have about any aspect of gardening. I have done out, outreach with children. Once we were at the Topsfield Fairgrounds where inner city children were bussed up for the day. We were gonna grow your own pizza. They were so enthusiastic. We planted tomatoes, basil and other herbs. Every child went home with a seed ball, which is a ball of peat moss or potting soil with seeds in it to plant at home. One child came up to me and asked, how do you go cheese? <laughs> a very smart question. We did tell him that there was no such thing as seeds for cheese as cheese from milk comes from cows. Another time I was at a master gardener's booth at a farmer's market. We had a great activity for little kids. They colored pictures of butterflies, cut them out, and attach them with pipe cleaners to their wrists. When they move their arms up and down, the butterfly wings moved up and down. Fun. And then there's the master gardener's helpline. 
Calls are taken about all kinds of gardening concerns and questions. I did the Botanical Garden helpline remotely on July 1 as a student master gardener was with, was with me. We had one question about tomato plants that were not doing well. The caller sent us a picture to help us make our diagnosis. We researched the problem and decided that the withered leaves at the top of the plant were the result of overwatering. We gave suggestions about how to solve the problem. Personally, I would have tossed out the plants and started over. But we said we hoped her plants recovered. So back at Ipswich River, where I was gardening in the bird and butterfly gardens, each session was begun with a gathering to talk about aspects of nature and environmental gardening. Had we seen any hummingbirds lately? Did we know that the males migrate here first before the females because the males were scouting out the perfect spot for nesting? Catherine then took us for a walk around the garden to see what was happening in nature. Weeding was the most important task. And rule number one is, if you can't identify a weed, don't pull it. Wait till next week when it will be bigger. By the way, Ralph Waldo Emerson describes a weed as, quote, a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered, end quote. We were the only people allowed in the bird garden. So the birds fly in and out, chipmunks scurry around, and we were always looking for monarch butterflies. One time we came in to see that the wire fence was bent over to the ground and all the bird feeders were empty. Some were on, poles were on the ground. We finally figured out that it was probably a bear. As I told my grandson Isaac, the story, he said, Nana, those weren't bird feeders, they were bear feeders. So what is environmental gardening anyway? To answer that question, I enrolled in Catherine's class titled Environmental Landscaping and Gardening. She should know all about this subject because she has a landscaping business and uses those practices. So I learned about biodiversity, ecosystems, native plants, invasive plants, and the web of life and the food chain, soil microorganisms, and the role of evolution and genetics in the environment and more. By this time, I was deep into my studies to become a master gardener. I attended weekly lecture class, did the homework, passed tests, the lecture were wonderful presenters and not one of us fell asleep after lunch. So what do master gardeners study? Botany, soils, nutrients, plants disorders, disease, insects, weeds, land care, propagation, landscape design, water use, pruning, native plants, and the last chapter was vegetables. We learned about plants that are host plants to butterflies. It turns out that they are chemically dependent on each other. Chemistry, you say? My experience in high school chemistry didn't last very long. As soon as I looked at those Bunsen burners, I figured I'd probably burn the lab down. So I went back to biology where I was very comfortable dissecting frogs. Adult learning, they say, is, a, is wonderful because the adult really wants to learn. Chemistry suddenly became relevant to me. I was amazed at how much I learned as a master gardener and being a, an environmental gardener. It was then that I came to the North Shore UU Church. The Green Sanctuary team had just gotten their own 25 by 25 foot plot. Now what they wondered, I knew what was coming next. Even though I had never grown a vegetable in my life, I volunteered to be the lean gardener and test my knowledge. 
When we started, it was a mass of weeds, tall weeds. We spent hours cultivating half the garden and creating rows to garden. We had big plans for making big deliveries to the people to people food pantry. We measured our, our production by the weight of the harvested produce. One time I brought in packages of red leaf lettuce. The manager was very happy to see all the lettuce. And she said, we've been praying for more produce to which I answered your prayers have been answered. Now I want to share my lessons from the garden. Number one, you can never make a mistake in the garden. Number two, there are always surprises in the garden. Number three, you can make a small part of the world more beautiful all by yourself. Number four, when you feel overwhelmed by the problems of the world, you might just have to go out in the garden and plant some flowers. When you can share the bounty of your garden, it will come back to you in many ways. Wholehearted effort makes a wholehearted garden. There is magic in the garden. Now, please rise in body and spirit as we sing hymn number one, two, three, Spirit of Life. What? Oh, I'm sorry. This is time in our service for joys and concerns. <laughs>
Thank you, Lord. Nancy and I last night uh, sang uh, the, in Bridgewater for the, uh, uh, let's see, Bridgewater State University Alumni Choir. Uh, and the, uh, the concert was dedicated to uh, Ukraine. Uh, we all got our little campaign uh, uh, ribbons for surviving that battle. And, uh, we actually raised quite a bit of money, uh, as it turns out. Uh, so that was the joy. I guess the, uh, the concern would be uh, going forth. Uh, I think the world's probably going to be finding out uh, how important Ukraine is to the world, uh, and, well, the economy and uh, food chain. And uh, hopefully it doesn't get as well. It's, it's bad, obviously, but. So that was my joy again, sir. My name is Dominic, and I just want to express some gratitude to I'm new to the area and I'm grateful to be a part of what seems like a very loving and accepting community and hope to go forth very prosperously. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I should have known this part was going to be a problem, but I, uh, one of my tenants found a mouse in his apartment in January. And I'm just, oh my God, I, you know, I'm freaking out because it was in my house. Um, I live in the same business. So um, what do I do? I call the working. And they come right out, they run into this, run into that, and do all that stuff. They've been back a couple of times. Well, they came back last week. So I'm up there chatting with the guys for a while. I hope, does this get ants? Because there was also an ant problem that they took over. It gets ants, it gets bees, it gets mice. I'm like, okay, <laughs> stop right there. <laughs> I mean, I don't want mice in my house. I don't want ants in my house. But we, I'm startled. I called right out and I can't wait. And so I'll pay the rest of my contract, I don't care, just, I just don't want to come around again. So the woman says, okay. And there's this really long sentence on the other end of the phone. I said, are you still there? She said, yeah. But I have to submit a reason why you don't want our service anymore. There's nothing about you don't want to kill the bees anymore. <laughs> so I mean, I'm glad I didn't count out before there were too many more applications. But you know what? I should have known. I, mean, I should have known before you got them going. So I don't know. But the joy I saw that it happened. I would like to welcome the new people here. Thank you for speaking. And yeah, you, sir, I think. First time here, correct? Yeah, I have a very problem. Um, first time here yeah. for you. Well, welcome. Anyone else? First time? No? Okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure to say that. And before we go to the next step, um, um, no, nope. now we're going to go to the next step. <laughs> Soon is up. So, um, in the spirit of meditation, I would like to offer this. And I call it weeding as a spiritual practice. The garden is a magical place. There's magic when the seeds sprout, the leaves unfurl. There is magic that is unseen. Photosynthesis above ground, microorganisms doing what they are meant to do underground. A person can get lost in the mysteries and magic of nature and gardening, except for the weeds. And we know with perfect certainty that the weeds are programmed to grow just as well as the prolific zucchini or bright sunflower. After all, we are gardeners. We pull weeds over and over again 
knowing that they lurk just underground, ready to sprout. I have come to know that there are aspects of weeding that are much like other meditative practice. This is true, even for an extrovert. Something comes over me when I'm in the garden with my weeder in hand, as close to the ground as I can be. There is no one to talk with except myself. And I am not nearly as interesting as the blue dragonfly that catches my eyes. Speaking of eyes, have you ever been very close to a dragonfly so that you can look in their eyes? It's quite amazing. There are rituals attached to this practice that have to be carefully followed. Instead of flowing comfortable garments, one must have long pants, preferably jeans, and a long sleeve shirt, no matter how hot the weather. White long socks are pulled up over pant legs to protect against ticks. A wide brim hat is essential and a large container of water should be nearby at all times. When weeding in hot weather, it's helpful to have a towel to wipe off. Now I am ready to weed, but not quite yet. I have to plan to this ritual. I can't just weed anywhere. No, there must be a purpose, a vision of what I will see when I have finished my meditation. There's that word again, meditation. Well, how can I be meditating and moving at the same time? Well, there's a like dance, slow and graceful. Weeding isn't rushed or loud. Weeds need to be dug deeply. This requires patience. An hour stretches into another hour. It takes discipline to stop, rest, drink water, stand up and look around. What do I see when I stand and look around? I see more clearly that my activity has produced. It'll, it is subtle. Weeding is like that. A weeded piece of soil looks plain and simple if the area isn't planted. If the area is planted, the plants seem to pop out with the weeds removed. Very satisfying to see. This view of the garden encourages me to continue weeding. I have been alone now for hours. My meditation is complete for this time. It has been quiet and peaceful. I feel centered in my being. I continue my exit ritual. I carry the buckets of weeds to the compost pile. I gather my tools. I water the rows of vegetables. I wind the hose in a neat circle on the ground. I walk away thinking of the next plan for my spiritual practice. It may not be exactly like anyone else's practice, for it brings me close to nature. I feel a part of something greater than myself. I have seen the mystery of life. There are mysteries in the garden for which I am at a loss to answer. Why did the Mexican bee beetle find its way to my bush beans? Why are the leaves that the little yellow bugs eat become a lacy see-through mess, even though the beans are healthy? And what about tiny native bees that come in different colors? And how about the monarch butterfly? How do they know what, it, what is the butterfly bush? In this garden is a magic collaboration with rain, sun, rich soil, weeds, and weeds. How fortunate am I to be able to have such a spiritual practice that I can come back to time and again. Amen and blessed be. And now please rise as in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life.
Now please join in a moment of silence. Blessed be. Reverend Victoria Weinstein, Weinstein teaches us that the purpose of the church is to encourage all who gather there to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This is the great end of all the world's faith traditions to bring the human being closer to the divine by acts of creation and compassion. We now take an offering that allows us to exercise that all important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. The gifts of the congregation will be most gratefully received. following story, entitled The Three Sisters, was recorded by Louis Thomas of Cornwall Island, Canada. It was one of a collection of legends compiled by students at Centennial College, Toronto, Canada. Out of respect to Native culture, we ask that you share the legend in a spirit of respect. This is The Three Sisters. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there were three sisters who lived together in a field. These sisters were quite different from one another in their size and also in their way of dressing. One of the three was a little sister, so young that she could only crawl at first and she was dressed in green. The second of the three wore a frock of bright yellow and she had a way of turning off by herself when the moon shone and the soft wind blew in her face. The third was the oldest sister, standing always very straight and tall above the other sisters trying to guard them. She wore a pale green shawl and she had long yellow hair that tossed about her head in the breezes. There was only one way in which the three sisters were alike. They loved one another very dearly and they were never separated. They were sure that they would not be able to live apart. After a while, a stranger came to the field of the three sisters, a little Indian boy. He was as straight as an arrow and as fearless as the eagle that circled the sky above his head. He knew the way of talking to the birds and the small brothers of the earth the shrew, the chipmunk, and young foxes. And the three sisters, the one who was just able to crawl, the one in yellow frock, and the one with the flowing hair, were very much interested in the little Indian boy. They watched him fit his arrow in his bow, saw him carve a bowl with his stone knife, and wondered where he went at night. 
Late in the summer of the first coming of the Indian boy to their field, one of the three sisters disappeared. This was the youngest sister in green, the sister who could only creep. She was scarcely able to stand alone in the field unless she had a stick to which she clung. Her sisters mourned for her until the fall, but she did not return. Once more, the Indian boy came to the field of the three sisters. She came to gather reeds at the edge of a stream nearby to make arrow shafts. The two sisters who were left watched him and gazed with wonder at the prints of his moccasin in the earth that marked his trail. That night, the second sister left, the one who was dressed in yellow and always wanted to run away. She left no mark of her going, but it may have been that she set her feet in the moccasin tracks of the little Indian boy. Now there was one left, tall and straight. She stood in the field, not once bowing her set head in sorrow, but it seemed to her that she could not live there alone. The days grew shorter and the nights grew colder. Her green shawl faded and grew thin and old. Her hair once long and golden was tangled by the wind. Day and night she sighed for her sisters to return to her, but they did not hear her. Her voice when she tried to call them was low and plaintive like the wind. But one day when it was season of the harvest, a little Indian boy heard the crying of the third sister who had been left to mourn there in the field. He felt sorry for her and took her in his arms and carried her to the lodge of his father and mother. Oh, what a surprise awaited her there. Her two lost sisters were there in the lodge of the little Indian boy and were very glad to see her. They had been curious about the Indian boy and they had gone home with him to see where he lived. They liked his warm cave so much that they had decided now that winter was coming to stay with him and they were doing all they could to be useful. The little sister in green now was quite grown up, was helping to keep the dinner pot full. The sister in yellow sat on the shelf drying herself. So she planned to fill the dinner pot later. The third sister joined them, ready to grind meal for the Indian boy. And the three were never separated again. This is called a wisdom story. And coming to this age, when we know more about science, we have learned what the indigenous people of this country knew just by intuition. The three sisters are corn, beans, and squash. And they have been planted by traditional Native Americans in many different places in North America. The traditional three sisters garden forms an ecosystem by creating a community of plants and animals. This system creates a beneficial relationship between the three plants. Each plant helps the other. This is a form of what we call companion planting. Modern day agriculturists know this as the genius of the Indians who interplanted pole beans and squash with corn using the strength of the sturdy corn socks to support the twining beans and the shade of the spreading squash vines to trap moisture for growing the corn. This bacterial colonies on the bean roots capture nitrogen from the air, some of which just released into the soil to nourish the high nitrogen needs of the corn. To Native Americans, however, the meaning of the three sisters runs deep into the physical and spiritual well being of their people. Known as the sustainers of life, the Iroquois consider corn, beans, and squash to be special gifts from the Creator. The well being of each crop is protected. Now, would you please join us in body or spirit? in singing hymn number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning.
Please join together in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish our flame. The power of love and love. Save us all. And Our benediction today is by May Sarton. Help us to be the always hopeful gardeners of the spirit who know that without darkness, nothing comes to birth and without light, nothing flowers. And we keep those words in our minds and in our hearts today.